Vamos a continuar y evitar que se nos vayan los tiempos. Eh, gracias por la puntualidad. Bueno, pues es, eh, como os decía, es un, es un placer, es un honor tener con nosotros a, a Yaroslav eh, Andel. Eh, yo conocí la propuesta, pues buscando por esos mundos de internet, ¿no? donde todos vamos buscando proyectos y propuestas que nos puedan eh, inspirar. Y, y entonces encontré la, la exposición que él ha comisariado y que ha tenido lugar entre enero y abril en, en Reykjavik, en Islandia. Y, y bueno, pues nos fuimos a ver dos personas del equipo, nos fuimos a ver la exposición y poder... Eh, tener esa experiencia en, en directo de, de la propuesta que Yaroslav eh, nos hacía. Bueno, él eh, os vamos a repartir luego para que tengáis también unos breves currículum de todos los ponentes, pero bueno, me interesa por un lado eh, su perfil también eh, múltiple, porque él es, eh, él es artista, es fotógrafo, es comisario de exposiciones, ha escrito montones de, de libros y de, y de estudios, eh, ha comisariado eh, diversas exposiciones y eh, ahora mismo él es el director, el director artístico del Centro de Arte 2, que es el Centro de Arte Contemporáneo en, en Praga. Es, mm, Está a caballo, ¿no? Entre Praga, Nueva York, me parece que, que son sus, sus rutas habituales. Y bueno, pues le agradecemos que, que pueda estar aquí con nosotros y, y conocer eh, de primera mano cuál es su propuesta eh, con esta exposición. Muchas gracias, Jaroslav. His proposal. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I am really honored to be here and I apologize for not speaking uh, Spanish. So I will talk about uh, three fundamental concepts which are subject actually of, of this course. Uh, and uh, these are of course learning and education, art and museums. So these three concepts and I am very happy to hear a very lively discussion because a number of points which I will mention or address uh, have been already discussed. Now, I would like to present three key ideas which relate, each of these ideas relate to one of those concepts. So, first, learning and education represents the critical field in today's society. Uh, second, art has a unique cognitive capacity. And third, the museum as an institution has to be reinvented. So let me briefly go into details, a bit details about these individual ideas. You can see that uh, there is certain hierarchy, certain order, how they are sequenced. So we can see this sequence in terms of biological evolution learning and education comes first because learning we know that even animals are learning then art comes second uh, something which is very much related to the history of humankind and third museum as an institution is is most contemporary of those concepts very recent one related of course to the enlightenment period so how these three concepts are related to each other. That is a question which I will go back and forth and I will use a case study. Case study uh, which is using actually uh, example of one specific exhibition which was basically devoted to engage these three concepts. So this exhibition was already mentioned in previous presentation, the title Back to the Sandbox, Art and Radical Pedagogy. And um, you heard that it was held uh, at the Reykjavik Art Museum. Then there are three other venues uh, which will happen next year. 
uh, in Stavanger, uh, which is in Norway, city in Norway, then in Chicago, Hyde Park Art Center, and then on the West Coast uh, in Bellingham University Museum. Now, this is not a typical traveling show because the goal of this show is not like a one product. It's not an end by itself. It's, it's a tool. It's a tool how to address these key ideas and not only that, also how to connect people from different fields uh, people who uh, share concern about education as the critical field today. Uh, so, I would like to mention background of this project. Uh, as you heard, I have been in the field of visual arts for many years, and I have curated many different exhibitions. And most recently, in the last seven years, uh, these exhibitions w were primarily focused on issues of democracy. Uh, my feeling was, um, especially after September 11, I was living uh, in New York. I, I could watch uh, for these twin towers uh, falling down from my window, and I witnessed how society uh, has changed in a dramatic way in the last uh, 15 years. Uh, of course, change for the worse, in my view. Uh, and, and we see how the uh, concept of democracy has been questioned, ha has been corrupted in many different ways. So I felt the obligation to address uh, these issues by organizing many different exhibitions, exploring different concepts. So just briefly, Modes of Democracy, which was organized two years, one year ago, traveled, was first in Prague and then traveled to Italy, uh, presented both inspiring stories but also cautionary tales of democratic practices, uh, including the issue of surveillance, but also the way that digital technology can be used also in a very inspiring way and that was the case in the exhibition an attempt to create a draft of a new constitution in Iceland um, then uh, ex for example exhibition uh, cartographies of hope uh, narratives of social change which actually grew out from my experience participating in Occupy Wall Street in New York when I felt how it is important to share certain narratives. And so what I did then was that I uh, approached many different artists from different countries and trying to find what image, social imaginary they are interested in, what kind of narratives they are using to see where are we coming from, where are we trying to go in the future. Or the Lucifer effect, which was an exhibition before that, which focused on abuse of power. Uh, it, uh, the title of the exhibition is from the book uh, focused on uh, social psychology experiments. And so what I presented in, in that exhibition uh, where original social psychology experiments and then also artists uh, uh, artist, uh, uh, when artists uh, trying to replicate those scientific experiments uh, and and then there were also exhibitions on political posters, uh, exhibition on the issue of future, uh, exhibition on uh, notions of disability, uh, entitled Disabled by Normality, and a retrospective of Krzysztof Wodiczko, uh, titled Outsiders, Insiders. So these two exhibitions explore the notions of discrimination, equality. So all these issues we can see are now very much in the air and uh, we see what's happening. 
in the US, in European countries, the rise of populism, uh, demagogues, um, questions about democracy as a viable social system. So this is the background of the exhibition, Back to the Sandbox. My background is not education, but I came to the conclusion by working on those exhibitions that really education is the critical field because that's where everything in a way starts. Starts for individuals and starts for society. And it's not only short term, but it's also long term. So if we want to have long term social change, it's only through education and learning. And so that's why I think it's really important for all of us, not just artists, educators, but scientists, activists, professionals of all kinds, but also citizens. We as citizens, we have to think about learning and education. So that's why I chosen this motto by Jean Piaget, one of the most important uh, theorists of learning education, founder of a new field of develop developmental psychology. And as you can read, he said in 1934, only education is capable of saving our societies from possible collapse, whether violent or gradual. So this is really framework of, of the project I was organizing. And it, again, it's a long-term project. It's open-ended project which tries to develop networks, both local and international, of people who are really concerned about this issue. Now, if you think of it that this statement comes from 1934, which means period of very actually similar to period of our times, when you had rise of totalitarian systems, when you have civil wars in Europe, um, and all that. So, so I think this statement is maybe more topical than it was, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. So this is Reykjavik Art Museum, where the exhibition was held, first venue. And above the entrance, you see there is an inscription in Icelandic, right? This is the work by Louis Kamnitzer, and it says, the museum is a school, the artist learns to communicate, the public learns to make connections. So this can be motto for, for our course, for our conference as well. And if you think of it, this comes actually to the very beginning of the museum as an institution. Because, as I said, museum, it's a recent invention. And its original mission was educational. So when Louis Kamnitzer argues this point, in a way, he questions uh, contemporary position of the museum. And I will come back to this point again later. So I will lead you through this exhibition and using examples of individual artworks, we can talk about these various angles, points, and issues. You can read this in introductory text, which basically says and makes this point about unique characteristic of art. It's unique cognitive capacity, which can be very important today when educational system is more and more questioned as something which is not up to date, which is in a way obsolete institution, institution which was created in the period of industrialization 
it was created for industrial society, but we live in a very different world. So when people are educated in a way which really is not able to address today's issues, we have a serious problem. Exhibition included several sections, and first introductory sections was dedicated to reformers and visionaries of education. Many ideas which are presented today as new ideas are in fact reiterations of ideas which came about already in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, this is tradition of progressive education and tradition which was partly forgotten, which was marginalized, which is out there, but often even people who are professionals forget about these key ideas, about the, their origins. And so it's no coincidence that some of contemporary artists today are rediscovering uh, these visionaries, these reformers, and the exhibition presented several cases of these personalities. So there was a video, a kind of didactic video, which provided a survey of ideas of, of selected reformers of education from starting from this philosopher uh, regarded as father of modern education. Of course, John Amos Comenius, or in Czech, Jan Amos Komensky, living in 17th century. But then, of course, more recently, these two important personalities, John Dewey and Jane Adams, both living in Chicago. And these two people, especially Jane Adams, uh, were um, selected by artist Jim Dinan, who is living in Chicago, as kind of hero he rediscovered. So the work by Jim Dinan in this exhibition called Swing uh, refers to Jane Adams' uh, social reforms and her whole house, which was part of social reforms, it was a settlement house for uh, poor emigrants. It provided housing, but also it provided education. And as you can see from the poster on your left, it also uh, created playground associated with this uh, settlement house. So what Jim Dinan is doing is basically going back in history and showing what uh, kind of ideas, original ideas, were part of new institutions such as playground. So this is a view of whole installation. Now, another hero for another artist is a Catalan anarchist, Francesc Ferrer Guardia. Guardia created the modern school movement, and uh, it was an important institution in Barcelona, frequented by many different people, including artists. We know that Pablo Picasso, young Pablo Picasso, living in Barcelona at that time, also was 
visitor to this school, but Ferrer, of course, as an anarchist, was in touch with network of anarchists throughout Europe, and so leading artists of the time, including Franciszek Kupka, pioneer of abstract art living in Paris, then also was in touch with Gerer. Now, artists who identify with Francesc Fer Guardia uh, is Priscilla Fernandez, a Portuguese artist living in Rotterdam, and she uh, created this project called uh, What About Art? The Book of Aesthetic Education of the Modern School. So the part of this inst installation were original publication of this modern art school movement. You can see them on your left. And when Priscilla researched this uh, movement, she uh, realized that there was no publication about art and aesthetics. So she decided uh, to create her own publication, which comprised historical text from that period. So basically it is a speculation what publication on aesthetic and contemporary art would look like if uh, it was created by the school movement. So part of this installation uh, were not just this historical text, but also chairs, as you can see, and those chairs carry engravings by some of the artists of the period. This is a drawing by Picasso from that period. And this installation then was used in an interactive participatory way because it served for discussions which were held during the exhibition. So that's first uh, section of the exhibition. But then there were two other uh, parts of, of the show uh, and, and they were devoted to <coughs> two contradictory traditions in modern education, control and liberation. So school, as we know, is uh, an example of modern institution. Uh, such as hospital, army barracks, all these kind of new institutions created uh, in the period of enlightenment and industrial society. And w what they all share is elements of control and discipline. And we know uh, very much about it thanks to Michel Foucault, who uh, devoted a lot of his uh, uh, scholarship and, and research to this subject. Uh, his book uh, on, this, uh, on, on this topic, Discipline and Punish, which actually sums up what are these uh, modern institutions about. So, so we see that this, this is very much part of school as we know it today. It's, it's really about discipline, control. It's authoritarian institution, yes. But there is also another uh, very opposite uh, characteristic of school or modern education, which is what? It's, it's about freedom. It's about empowerment. When you learn something new, it opens up new spaces. So, so, so we see that these two uh, kind of uh, uh, faces, you can even say, of modern education are out there, but unfortunately uh, still modern education as an institution is dominated uh, by, by the, the former principle, uh, this authoritarian principle. And, and uh, I would argue that uh, school as something, uh, school is mostly, uh, as we see it as something which is really about discipline. But original meaning of the term actually is something very different, it means fun. So to learn something, it's, it's originally associated with fun. 
Uh, and, and so artists are making in, in, in this section of the exhibition these two points. So let me show you some examples. This is work by Eva Koťátková, Sit Straight, and it's kind of self-explanatory. You maybe uh, from your own experience uh, <laughs> might remember what it was to be in elementary school, to be silent, to sit straight, <laughs> don't disturb, and, and, and so on. What, what is also interesting about this artist is that uh, she uh, has chosen not only theme, theme of school, but also psychiatric asylum as two primary examples. So, so you see th there are really uh, characteristics which, which uh, these two institutions share very much, hospital and school. Now another artist, uh, James Mollison, a photographer, uh, was represented uh, by his series Playground. Uh, it's also a book uh, published by Aperture. And uh, James Mollison traveled all around the world and took pictures of playgrounds. Now, you, you might remember the picture uh, of poster uh, when uh, Jane Adams uh, established playground with Hall House, which was a democratic place for all kids of different backgrounds. Uh, so when you look at uh, James Mollison photographs, this is a different idea of playground. What, what you see here is what it's uh, conformity, standardization, again, control and discipline. So it's in a way an example of what I was talking about, this development from empowerment, liberation to control and, and discipline. So let's see the image from uh, Comenius Orbis Pictus uh, when playground look in a very different way. There is no conformity uh, there. Now, other works in these sections were by Priscilla Fernandez. Two videos, uh, one called To the Playground and the other one For a Better World. Now, juxtaposition of these two works are interesting because what you see on this image, it's a, from a video uh, by, by Fernandez. It's a playground designed by Aldo van Eyck, uh, who was uh, uh, an important architect, Dutch architect, who created this new concept of playground, very much more kind of participatory, adventurous form of playground. And what you see here is actually adults uh, playing uh, on that playground. But what is the idea behind uh, this playing on the playground? Uh, these are people from one company, from one, one corporations, and uh, uh, they do this exercise for very specific reason. They do it to be more productive, to kind of introduce new, new better working dynamic, social dynamic between uh, individuals of, 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 that, uh, of that group. So what you see here is an example of instrumentalization of play as something against the original uh, origins of play. And the other example, uh, you have something similar. It's children in a theme park, basically corporate theme park, where children uh, imitate adult words. So it's a very curious way that you see uh, adults imitating children and children imitating adults. And what is it for? Again, it's instrumentalized something for higher productivity. It's not about thinking. 
It's, a, it's not about empowerment and education. It's really about to be more productive worker for workplace. So, conclusion of this section on control and discipline is a work by Anna Hiord Gutu uh, titled Freedom Requires Free People. And it's a film, documentary film, about a boy, teenage boy, who, ha who has problems in, in school environment. Uh, he, he is uh, bored in school. And, and so he's disciplined, and he, he feels discriminated against. And, and this film is basically about his rebellion against school as an institution. Now you might know from your friends, maybe from your own experience, there are many kids like that. Because children are not alike. E each uh, kid is individual. And so if you force them to be same, basically, to conform with very rigid rules, uh, a lot of them would have problems, and, and they do. And I know, I mean, <laughs> many friends who have kids in school, and they have exactly those problems. And, and it's, it's really serious, because very often uh, then they are disciplined, they are labeled as something who are uh, not fitting into social patterns and norms, and, and this then goes to creating negative self-image about themselves. This is very destructive for all life. So, um, again, this is something we have to think about, and we have to change this, otherwise we are really destroying this maybe more, m most precious resource we have, which is creativity, intelligence, uh, ability to learn, yes? Now, maybe most important uh, visionary in, in this whole exhibition and inspiration for an artist is this person. Friedrich Frebe, who lived in the first half of 19th century, and he created what's called kindergarten movement. Kindergarten was created by him about uh, 1840, it, it gradually was formed in, in 1830s, and then already in 1840s, 1850s, it spread all over the world very quickly in Europe and even in the US, yes. And what, what um, Friedrich Frebel did, that he created kind of holistic system of education. Uh, part of it was what, see, this is a lithograph from the 19th century. Uh, and part of his system what, was what he called uh, gifts and occupation. And uh, so uh, on your left you see orig original box produced in, in the United States in mid 19th century. And it's produced even today. Uh, that's a picture on your uh, right. And, and, but it basically is what, what was in, in that original box. And, and so these, basically all building blocks or these kind of toys, which you know, even f maybe from your kindergarten, they all started with this kindergarten movement. Now, this is very important for not only history of education, but also for hist history of modern art. And this is part of history which was suppressed, which was forgotten. And I show you a couple of examples here. The reason is that first generation of uh, artists who were pioneers of modernism were actually first generation of kindergarten kids. And so 
in a way, what they did in their work as artists, they replicated their experience from kindergarten. So you can find many examples. You see um, here, uh, in a more explicit way, comparison between uh, one of those uh, gifts and occupations created by Frebel and in, in the double image on the right, you see uh, Piet Mondrian abstraction, uh, or in this previous uh, slide, you see on, on your left uh, comparison again from uh, this uh, gifts and occupation and, and comparing it to Paul Klee painting. Uh, then you have Frank Stella painting and uh, again some examples of uh, some ex exercises created by Frebel. But there are some other examples even in architecture. For example, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, even used in his practice uh, some of examples of gifts and occupation. Uh, so, so this is a very important chapter of um, modernist history which was suppressed, uh, you don't know about it. And, and this uh, became very important topic for another artist in the exhibition. So on your right you see a um, diagram, many of you might recognize what this diagram is, uh, where is it coming from. It, it is Alfred Barr, very famous diagram of modern movements. Alfred Barr was, was of course the first director of Museum of Modern Art in New York. And so uh, Michael Joachim Gray uh, is making point here. He's uh, kind of uh, rediscovering this forgotten history and inserting kindergarten movement as actually the first movement f in um, modernist history. And, and what, what Michael Joachim Gray is basically doing, you can say, it's kindergarten 2.0. Uh, so I can show you one of the examples how he finds direct inspiration on gifts and occupation. So you see, on your left, it's a picture again from 19th century, and what this girl is playing with is building blocks, frail building blocks. And when you look on your right, this is a set, building set created by Michael Joachim Gray in early 1990s, very much inspired by Freiber's gifts and occupation. You see that, that this first unit is basically uh, something uh, directly inspired by Frebel. It's a small figure, it's a homunculus. Uh, and the point here is that this construction set is not just geometry, but it's also based on body empathy. You see, it's, it's about figure. And so using this uh, building set, you can create not only buildings, but you can create organic world. You can create plants, animals, See, you see a model of DNA, for example. But what we did in this exhibition, we created Zoop Playground. Zoop is the name for this, uh, for this building set. And so people could play with, with this uh, set in the exhibition. And uh, so in a way, this is variation of Frebel's gifts and occupation, uh, and, and something which should be uh, said here is that um, this is in a way creating a new alphabet, yes, because when you compare this building set to, let's say, L Lego, yes, which is most popular, big business everywhere, uh, you see how Lego is in a way very primitive because what you can do, it's basically bricks, yes? And wh how you can, what can you do with bricks? Not, not much, I mean, you can, of course, uh, raise buildings, yes? But if, if you would be asked to create an animal or, or skeleton, <laughs> you, you cannot do that. But, 
but with uh, with uh, Zoop you can, yes. So so that's why uh, this can be used by three-year-old kid to play with, but it's also used by scientists to uh, create very sophisticated. Uh, biological models, and uh, it is really used by Harvard University, NASA, and so on. So, uh, why the sandbox? Uh, this is again something which has its historical origins, and it again goes back to kindergarten. Now, part of this Exhibition. We created a sandbox, of course, in, in the exhibition, so people could play in it. But we had also this original document, which actually tells you how this idea came about. This is from a letter by Hermann von Arnswald, who was a follower, student of Fröbel. <laughs> and he had this idea in 1847, and he wrote in this letter to Frebel that it would be a very nice idea to have a plane of sand for people and, and kids can play uh, and, and, uh, and this is something which then again spread all over the world and now you find it everywhere. You forget, you don't know where is it coming from, uh, but it's again no coincidence. So. Um, in the exhibition, there are a number of works of artists who are not representing one group or one movement. It, those artists are from different generations, different countries, and they are using this cultural form for some reason. And I'll show you what is the particular reason in each case. So this work is a documentation of a happening. Uh, you can recognize uh, Václav Havel before he became president of uh, Czechoslovakia after the Velvet Revolution, playing uh, um, in a sandbox, uh, and other people are representatives of other dissident groups. This happening uh, took place in October 1989, so shortly, several weeks before so-called Velvet Revolution. Uh, the title of this uh, is uh, The Sandbox, Each in His Corner, and there was a very specific uh, idea behind this uh, happening. It was organized by a group called Society for a Merrier Marry a future, uh, and uh, the point was uh, let's think how it would be to uh, unite, how it would be to collaborate, how it would be to work together. Because what was happening then, the dissident movement was splintered into m many small groups, uh, and those groups, of course, did not collaborate together because, of course, it was very difficult uh, under this communist suppression. They were followed, interrogated, some of them sent to prison, like Václav Havel, several times, and so on. But this was late in, in the late 80s when the control of this regime was all, all, already loosening up. And so uh, this, this group, uh, which organized happenings all over Prague in public spaces, made this point it's about time, let's collaborate. So, see, w what is here happening? The sandbox as a cultural form bec becomes something uh, political, yes? Something which brings idea of common space, of collaboration, of freedom in an uh, authoritarian system. Now, this is another work in the exhibition by Peter Nickel called Fata Morgana, a sand object for drawing by light. And um, it's a different uh, take on, on the idea of, 
of uh, sandbox. It's it's uh, a sandbox, but sandbox used as a as a mirror. And and the idea of artists is uh, that public should participate uh, by drawing, making patterns in the sand, and then uh, using spotlight on on that mirror, uh, they create uh, reflected image on the wall and 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 then this work is changing all the time uh, so so this is uh, again something which relates to no, uh, s specific uh, cultural object the sandbox but s context of this work is 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 uh, again very unique uh, it has to do with this artist who um, works always in a very uh, participatory way, engaging uh, the public um, and uh, often documenting the process of change. Uh, so, so that's another take, an idea, uh, idea of participation, creativity. Now. The exhibition uh, opened uh, um, in, in January this year, but in, when I work on this exhibition, there was an article by Renzo Piano in The Guardian in the summer, and, and uh, what Renzo Piano, this one of the most important, most famous architect, uh, was telling that he loves to build sandcastle up, and every summer he goes with his grandchildren to the beach and, and, and build this sandcastle and, and he gives instruction how, how to do it. Yes. So then I found out when I researched this topic that uh, yeah, there were illustrations. This is not by Renzo Piano. This is by uh, somebody asked by Guardian to illustrate his article. Uh, then, then I found out that there is indeed an artist who <laughs> creates for decades a very elaborate sandcastle on, on many different beaches. His name is Calvin Seibert. He lives in New York City. Uh, so there was a whole slideshow of his, his sandcastles in, in, in the exhibition. Now, this work is by Markus Kaiser called Solar Sinter, and what you see is a 3D printer uh, which is powered by solar energy. And this artist uh, constructed this 3D printer and went to Sahara Desert using uh, solar energy and uh, then using sand uh, as a material to create uh, 3D objects. Uh, and now um, you can see this as an extension again of, of the sandbox Sahara being called maybe largest sandbox in the world here. And, and what is it here? Artists is ag engaging these ideas about environment, about energy, about mati natural material, and again about play and creativity. So you, you can see how one cultural form can get many different interpretations uh, and engaging many uh, important ideas of today. So the, it's a whole video by Kaiser which was presented in the show. I show you just a few shots from that video. Now, the garden, of course, uh, the word kindergarten uh, comes from uh, two words, uh, children and uh, child and garden. And so the, the notion of garden is again an imp important one here. And I can tell you one interesting anecdote. Uh, when I was mentioning that uh, even professionals, educators, f forget about uh, important histories. Uh, I can tell you this anecdote which I learned from Michael Gray. He was telling me about his friend who is a headmaster in New York and as you might know in New York every school has a playground. Yes, yeah? so we were talking about playground, that's one history. 
And this headmaster was telling Michael as a great um, story, we were able to uh, get a garden. We now have not only playground for basketball and other whatever, baseball and so on for our students, but we have also garden, which is great. And so Michael asked her, and do you know what the word kindergarten means? She didn't know. <laughs> so, so that tells you a very important story. And, and so that's why uh, Michael uh, came up not only with sandbox, but we, he came with this idea of orange tree sandbox. So, so you have, uh, you have this, this connection of this original connection of, of garden and sandbox. You might remember then in that letter I showed you about this idea of, of sandbox. Uh, there was a statement that sandbox is a miniature kindergarten, yes, garden. So, so now you see here in this image connection of the two. And, and Michael uh, elaborate on this idea um, in a uh, number of ways he created this large installation and part of it was his earlier work called Northern Romantic Citrus. What you see is of course a famous painting by Carl Gasp Gaspar Friedrich. It's actually from Northern Bohemia mountains um, in Northern Bohemia. And my, what Michael did is that he animated, the, of course, using digital technology, uh, he created computational video, and this oak tree all of a sudden grows oranges. So, so this, uh, this idea of uh, climate change, you can say, um, is also idea of garden, and then uh, Michael m created this new work for, for the exhibition called 1000 Citrus Tree at Thingvellir. Thingvellir, as you might know, is, is this very important site in Iceland where uh, first, what they call first parliament in ninth, ninth century assembled each year to decide very important questions of Icelandic society. And uh, so Michael um, created um, first uh, a series of photomontages. Uh, you see orange tree growing uh, on, on that very important historical site. And then we organized a pedagogical happening uh, there. Um, and, and so this is idea begin caring for 1,000 citrus tree in preparation for a time approaching when oranges may be indigenous to Iceland and the north. And so uh, with uh, about 30 kids, we went from Reykjavik uh, to, to this place, uh, which is like one hour drive. Uh, and then uh, kids were bringing this one orange tree Yes, to this place. And then there was a discussion uh, with kids how they would care, what, what do they think about this climate change. And, and then uh, the idea was that uh, maybe we uh, could get seedlings, or orange seedlings, and then we would give them away for kids to take care of them. And this is, of course, a symbolic gesture, which is summed up in, in, in this uh, note by the artist, uh, the idea of displacement. And it's not only about plants uh, and animals, but it's also about people. And it's, it, it was actually this uh, happening took place uh, in time when this refugee crisis started in Europe. Uh, so, uh, the point here is, uh, again, how it's all interconnected, yes, uh, that, that um, art, uh, learning, museum, um, climate change, science, it, it's all somehow connected. So, 
so what art does is that art has this unique capacity to see it in, in a more kind of holistic way, that it can connect things which usually are unconnected. And it's, it's maybe only field which is not instrumental in that sense like science is. Science is all, always about something very par particular. It has to be focused, yes, it has to be specialized. But art is not. Art, by definition, is something which is addressing these fundamental questions and relates things and poses new questions and so on, yes? So um, maybe uh, to make this point, uh, I would like to show you at, at this very end uh, a short video which maybe you would not think that it directly relates to the subject of the presentation, but uh, it's about learning, and, and um, let's see it. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. It's an experiment with two capuchin monkeys, yes. And, and what they did that they uh, had two monkeys side by side, that's what he's saying. And they fooled them with cucumber first. Now if you give the part the grapes, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a and then they decided to yeah, you give you one monkey grapes, yes? So one monkey gets just cucumbers, and the other monkey gets grapes, and you see what happens. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. See, the, on the left, she gets cucumber. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. Yes, and she does the task. Then the second monkey gets grapes. So something more valuable. See, she sees it, the other monkey. But she gets only cu cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> so again <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here so that's the point what you see is a Wall Street protest here. So I think that this is basically coming full circle to the beginning of presentation when I uh, talk uh, about these three ideas, how they are uh, in a very specific order, learning and education coming first with biological evolution. And, and, and so the point here is that uh, you cannot separate things like ethics, moral, from aesthetic, for example, yes? Uh, that even animals, some animals, uh, have notion of morality or equity, equality. And, and that's very much part of education and learning. So uh, that would be my final point that, um, and already in, in previous discussion we heard that uh, these issues about uh, on one hand uh, we are specialized in one field or another uh, and it's wonderful that, that you are coming here from different backgrounds, artists and educators and uh, curators and uh, so on. Uh, and, and I think that's very important. Uh, uh, so so uh, I, I, I uh, believe that, that this is something we, we have to think much more about uh, 
to reinvent our institutions because we live in a world which is very different from what it was just, uh, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. It's much more interconnected. So we have to collaborate in a much more substantive way than we are used to. And that's a great challenge because we were educated in a very specialized way. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's difficult for us to address these issues. And you can name it. I, I mean, uh, there was uh, climate change uh, mentioned, all these environmental issues. It, they are so complex, they involve everything in a way, many d different disciplines. So to address this issue, but any big issue we take, it's very similar. Uh, if, if it's just one specialist, it's just hopeless. So, so I think art uh, and, and museum as an institution can do a lot here, uh, but it has to change too. Yes, and, and, and I think this is what uh, this course is about. Institutions are, are conservative by, by definition. It takes a lot of time to change them. Uh, they have their own temporality, which is very different from, let's say, temporality of technology or even scientific discovery, which is uh, kind of uh, on, on high speed, higher and higher speed. You have this acceleration in, in certain segments of society, while in the others it's, it's not really uh, speeding up, and it's, it's maybe impossible to speed it up, yes? But still, we, we have to, we have to um, change our institutions, and, and, and this is, I think, a um, great challenge for, for, for you, uh, uh, because uh, you are coming after your studies to, uh, to have that opportunity. And, and here I would uh, maybe close with this uh, paradox of, of our brain. Uh, uh, what, what, what is important, I should add uh, a note, uh, that what is uh, part of this uh, project is uh, that, that it uh, tries to connect different fields, technology, neuroscience, and, and so on. So, so I learned um, working with one, one leading neuroscientist who wrote this book, Brain and Culture. His name is uh, Bruce Wexler. And he may, makes this point in his book that there is this uh, strange paradox uh, that, that uh, he's writing about the neuroplasticity, the fact that the brain is capable of change, that it, it, uh, new, new neurons are growing all the time, and it's called neuroplasticity. It's a very recent uh, discovery because in the, up till 1990s we thought that the brain is dead after, like uh, in mid-age, that it cannot grow new neurons. So it, it does, but the problem is that this neuroplasticity is changing, and it is, of course, greatest when you are young, when you are a kid, and when you are a teenager. That's where uh, brain really grows very rapidly, and it's very plastic, yes? So that, of course, provides incredible uh, competence to ability to learn new things, yes? For example, when, when you are 10 years old, you can learn any language without having accent. After 13, 14 years old, it's not possible. Or, yeah? So this is just one example. Now, on one hand, so you have this great plasticity ability to learn when you are young, but you cannot really intervene. You, you cannot change the world. You cannot make changes. You, you don't have maybe enough experience for that, but you also don't have authority. You don't have power to do that. So, so you can do that when you are adult, when you are 30, maybe 40, sometimes in some societies when you, you, you are 50 or 60 years old. Yes, but that's when <laughs> your brain is stuck like 40 years ago in a way, yes, in, in your cognitive architecture. So there is this paradox that people who are politicians, but maybe some other professions too, they make these changes based on their experience which are referring to a world which does not exist anymore. 
Yes. So there is this uh, strange paradox, and we have to think about it. What to do? Yes. And and this is this is the fact. And and uh, just 20 years ago, we didn't know about this. Yes. So so this is something which can inspire us. And 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 I think. Uh, uh, it, 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 we should, uh, we should uh, be engaged. Uh, thank you very much.